like someone kicked over some buckets of paint and they spilled on the canvas and they hung it up. And I have actually overheard conversations that have gone just like this. I've been standing there looking and saying, and someone wants to know, and then there's self-proclaimed authority. And they're looking at this splattering of paint on this canvas, and one person says, well, well what is that? And the, and the self-proclaimed authority says, well, that's a great work of art. Oh, well, how much is that worth? Oh, well, oh, that's priceless. Oh, well, what's that entitled? Oh, that is entitled Man's Inner Struggle with Self. And I feel like saying, yeah, and he lost right there. <laughs> because it's garbage. <laughs> Looks like someone vomited right there. You say, you're so old, brother, are you being gross? Oh, no, I'm just being truthful. Amen. You understand? Because art is supposed to represent truth. Relativism, oh, it is whatever you think it is, nonsense. That's humanism in the visual form. When are we going to wake up to this stuff and quit allowing the world to get over on us. We need to understand once again that a constitution of government, once changed from freedom, can never be restored. Liberty, once lost, is lost forever. So that's why we need to hold on to it. And I'm so very thrilled at what just happened November the 8th. And if you're not, then you need to rethink some things. <laughs> Say, well, Brother Hardy, Look, if I agreed with you and you thought you, you don't think that what happened on November the 8th is a good thing for our country, if I agree, I, look, if I would agree with you, then we'd both be wrong, okay? <laughs> You'll get that. <laughs> Number three, and lastly, true liberty always comes at great <clears throat> personal sacrifice. That means it's birthed in blood. That means if someone desires to live free, someone else must be willing to die, to give that ultimate price for that freedom. What we see today, I believe, is this. We see people that want all the rights, but none of the things that go along with the rights, none of the duties that go along with the rights. <clears throat> 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence, and only six of them got back to sign the Constitution. Many of them suffered great loss. When they signed the Declaration of Independence, you know what they were doing? Committing high treason against the greatest military in the world. They had no chance as far as man's estimation. But this is what they said that's been recorded for us to learn from. Before they pledged to each other anything, they said, with firm reliance upon the protection of divine providence, we pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. What they were saying, it was like an invitation. They said, we're putting everything on the line on this contest. You know, I'm not going to ask anyone to come forward tonight to an old-fashioned altar and put your life in jeopardy. I'm not going to ask anyone to come up here and put your mortgage on the altar or your 401k or your life savings or everything that you've worked for. But that's what 56 men did for us. Do you know why? Because no matter who they were, and some of them were recipients of ancestral wealth coming down to them from hundreds of years. Some of them were self-made men. One of them was an indentured servant that worked for seven years to gain his liberty. They all had one element of character that was birthed in them from the Great Awakening. Sacrifice. That had been preached into them and a sacred fire that had begun in their hearts to burn. Mm -hmm. And from reading the Bible and preaching of men that were preaching in the threat of their own life because they weren't established from a state-run church, they were willing to do anything. And Ben Franklin, never at a loss for anything to stay, <laughs> after they signed it, said, well, we all better hang together or we were all assuredly hang separately. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
Sacrifice is a very unique thing. And it gets more rare every single day our society goes forward. I'm about to introduce to you a gentleman that literally put his life on the line. That thought perhaps very good chance he was going to die doing what his commander had asked him to do. A man just like your eye that had fear but controlled his fear and controlled fear equals great courage. The sacrifice that defines us as Americans, that makes us who we are, that gives us what we have, greatest sacrifice we know is what? The Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. I've wondered sometimes as I have traveled with my friend, the times, the honor that I've had to just share conversation and listen to his stories. What puts it in the heart of an American serviceman to do what Virgil Woodrow Williams did and what many others have done? And then I realized, oh yeah, we're a Christian nation. We have Christian values. And even if we may not be living from a Christian experience, we have Christian memory ingrained in our culture. And greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Wow. Woody Williams laid down his life that day. And God spared it. He is 93 years old. Yeah. Sharp as a tack. Mentally and physically. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to you the personification of sacrifice and duty and honor. My friend. Our national treasure. Herschel Woodrow Williams. Sir, 
I didn't need one then. <laughs> so you may need a haircut before I'm finished. <laughs> You know, the day that you and I were born, and I can only speak for self, the day I drew my first breath, I inherited two of the greatest gifts that could come to mankind or to a human being anywhere in the world. First, was the gift of life that God gave me. Amen. Amen. The second was the gift of freedom. Amen. That my fellow human beings sacrificed their life so I could be born free. There is a young Marine, about 24 years old. The name is Kyle Carpenter. Kyle was in Afghanistan. And they were guarding a road intersection. And they were into a firefight. And in order to get some idea of what was out forward of them, Kyle and one of his fellow Marines climbed up on top of a building. And they were lying on the top of the building firing at, we don't call them enemies anymore, we call them insurgents. <laughs> to me, they're enemies if they're trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but they were firing at the insurgents. And one of them got away and came close enough to the building that he could toss a grenade up on top of the building. It landed between Kyle and his Marine buddy. Kyle, without thought, rolled his body on that hand grenade to save the life of his buddy. His right arm was broken in 30 some places. His teeth were all blown out. He lost his right eye. He should not have survived. But God wasn't ready for that. Kyle, as a result of that sacrifice, was the youngest of the recent to receive the highest medal that our country can give to an individual. When I wear this medal around my neck, having received it on October the 5th, 1945, from an individual I consider having saved my life, or not personally, perhaps. But my whole outfit was geared to go to a place called Kyushu. Some say it differently. But all six Marine divisions, 120,000 of us, were geared to take that island just south of Japan. October the 5th was the date we were to depart. We had absolutely no concept of what we were getting into because all the time that we'd been in the Pacific, and I'd been there almost three years for that time, every bit of training that we had was jungle warfare because that's where the enemy was. But all of a sudden, when we came back from Iwo Jima, all of a sudden, they began training us for street fighting. How do you approach a house? How do you go down the street? How do you 